Today we're going to talk about springs, which turn out to be an important part of energy conservation and actually of dynamics, which we didn't talk that much about, but we will. All right, a spring in general is a coiled piece of metal, something like this, uh, shown here, many different ones. And due to its internal structure, a spring will resist efforts to deform it. If you push on it, it will push back. If you stretch it, it will try and pull back. When no forces are applied to the ends of the spring, it has a certain length, which we call its natural length, or its unstretched length, or its unstressed length, or its equilibrium length. Uh, these terms are interchangeable, and people just go with whichever one they want, but you can use any one you, uh, you want, whatever appeals to you. If a force is applied to an end, then the inner parts of the spring exert forces on the end so as to get the spring back to its natural length. In fact, I should be a little bit more careful here. If the spring is stretched at all, it exerts that force on both ends to try and re to return to its natural length. So even if you pull on one end, the spring will pull the other end uh, back, and if it's not attached to anything, then the spring won't stretch, it will just move. Uh, if it is attached to something, then it exerts the same force on, on that something as it is exerting on you. Most springs obey what's called Hooke's Law, which says that the force exerted by the spring is directly proportional to how far it has been stretched or compressed from its natural length. Hooke was a rival to Isaac Newton. Uh, they had a famous multi-decade um, competition, uh, and this is his main, con his main contribution that we remember from in physics is Hooke's Law, but he's sort of all over early bits of chemistry and physics uh, and engineering. It's not surprising that he derived Hooke's Law because he was very much an experimentalist, built most of the machinery for the early days of the Royal Society. Although the law seems pretty tame, it's actually pretty deep. It can be shown that nearly any system that has an equilibrium will behave like a spring when near that equilibrium. That is, if you talk about um, traffic flow on a highway and which has a sort of steady pattern, and then someone taps their brakes, the cars, at least at first, react as if they were just simple spring systems, and there's an oscillation that goes on that is mathematically modeled almost identically to what we're going to do here with springs. And that works for blood pressure or air pressure in a room, or really any system that has an equilibrium and a tendency to return to that equilibrium. There will be some region near the equilibrium where it looks like a spring. What that means is understanding springs, in some sense, is the same as understanding the physical universe. Mathematically, we express Hooke's law as F sub S, the force of the spring, equals K times S. Fs is the magnitude of the force of the spring. Um, for this formulation, it's the magnitude of the force. It doesn't include its direction. S is the distance the spring has been stretched. Uh, or, if we're going to do magnitudes, or compressed. The deformation in the spring um, from its equilibrium length. And then k, this thing k, is called the spring constant because it's the constant that tells us how strong the spring is. And yes, it's the usual physics way of choosing incredibly obvious names. The constant associated with the spring is called its spring constant. Um, larger k's are stronger springs. You can see that the units of k would have to be newtons per meter. If, we have, if we're going to get um, newtons on this side, and we have whatever k is times meters over here. Clearly, k has to be newtons per meters. If you write out that newtons are kilogram meters per second squared, that means the unit of k is also kilogram per second squared. But no one ever writes that. That would be very unusual to run into. A spring that has a high value of k is said to be a stiff spring, while one with a low value of k is said to be a soft spring. Values of k vary widely, though. The clickable ballpoint pen, the kind of thing you might have in your shirt pocket, that has a spring with a k is about 3 newtons per meter. The springs that we used at the start of the lab of the year in the first lab we did, they have k values that were around 25 newtons per meter. And a slinky is somewhat softer than that, maybe 10 or 15. Shock absorbers in a car suspension will have springs in them where k is around 20,000 newtons per meter. Um, that's why if you sit on the hood of a car, it does depress a little bit, but not a lot, because you don't weigh very much, and so you don't add additional stretch. NORAD headquarters in Cheyenne Mountain is a complex of office buildings uh, built into a mountain and put on giant springs to resist nuclear blasts. They have a K of around 1 mega newton per meter, or 1 million newtons per meter. One of the things to keep in mind is that very often when working on the tabletop, you won't stretch things by a meter. So you'll probably do your distances in terms of centimeters, but to get a standard value of K, you have to convert those back to meters. So just be aware of that, that will often, when we're using springs, will work uh, in a centimeter scale, but you'll be quoting K in, new, in a meter scale. So just keep track of that. In fairness, it's important to note that different people quote Hooke's Law in slightly different ways. For instance, your textbook likes to say uh, F sub S uh, 
is minus KD, where here they're putting a direction on F sub S, and they're saying it's always opposite to the stretch. So if the thing is positively stretched, the force points negatively. And if the thing is negatively stretched, i.e. compressed, the force points positively. It's always opposed to what you're doing to the spring. And a lot of textbooks like that as a, uh, a mnemonic to remember it. But I find it's often dangerous for students. They get all tripped up by where the minus is, and then the diagram should be minus, and so on. So I like to work with just the magnitudes as usual. Uh, I also don't like doing using d as a variable, and that's just a personal uh, bugaboo. d is very close to the differential operator in calculus, so it will end up making formulas look weird, and I'd rather not see it. So I use s. Feel free to use d if it's easier to remember d for distance rather than s for stretch. Um, also, or you could look at the College Board. College Board uses this format where they say the magnitude of the vector force fs is k times the magnitude of x. Um, right. So again, going back to magnitudes and saying there is. It, the force is a vector, but its size is k times however far it's been displaced from equilibrium. Uh, I don't really like that because we already use x. We have a meaning for x, and I don't like suddenly changing meanings, although it's very common to. Um, and just be aware that they often will quote things in terms of x. A common way to measure k is to suspend known masses from the spring and generally lower each one until it's equilibrium, until it reaches equilibrium, and then measure the resulting stretch. This is the lab that we did at the very start of the year. If hanging a mass m1 from a spring yields an equilibrium when the stretch is s1, we could use Newton's second law to find k. We look over at our free body diagram, which is almost trivial, but if we're in equilibrium, then the stretch upward, the force of the spring upward, will exactly balance the weight pulling downward, so the net force will be 0. So k times the stretch minus m1 times the g times g is going to be 0, and so we get the important um, result, but not a thing to memorize, that if we've done this apparatus, k is m1g over s1. Be really careful. It's very easy to set up these measurements in slightly different ways, so do not memorize this. F see how where it came from. Start always from the second law. Ideally, of course, we wouldn't plot one, because we know that's always risky. We'd, plot, we'd hang multiple masses and make a plot of mg on the vertical axis versus s on the horizontal axis, and that would tell us that um, the slope would be k, because here we would have um, m... Oops that we would have m1 or mg is ks. So we see that the vertical is the horizontal times some constant. The slope is the constant. So this is the slope. That would look something like this. Here we've got, uh, this is actually data from the lab at the first of the year. I just grabbed somebody's uh, file and massaged it into the right form. And we can see we have the weight over here versus the stretch over here. And Desmos tells us that the, this line is given by f equals 25.18s, and so therefore k must be 25.18 newtons per meter, which is good because this was the red spring, which is Pasco tells us has a value of 25 newtons per meter. Uh, they say plus or minus 5%, but we got pretty well in there. All right, that's been the dynamics of springs. Now let's start talking about the energetics of springs. Let's consider the work done by a spring on an object that is stretching it from a stretch of zero to some stretch of s. Uh, it's going to be really important that we keep track of who's doing the work and who's being affected. So here I'm saying, I am pulling on a string, a spring. It pulls back on me. What work does it do on me as I stretch the spring? So I'm going to, I'm using my muscles to stretch the spring. The spring is resisting by doing work back on me. The force curve would look something like the figure shown. Uh, Again, same kind of thing. We would plot the force, and it would be minus ks in this case because as we stretch the object, the force pulls back towards the origin. Because it's below the axis, of course, it's negative, which is not surprising. And then the work is simply the area. This is the stuff from the section on varying forces. So the work done by the spring while stretching is 1 half base times height. The base is side s. And the height is the value of the force at that moment. But that's, minus, that's uh, ks, or minus ks in this case. And so the work done is um, one half, minus 1 half k times s squared. And that kind of thing is going to pop up a lot. Spring works uh, are, and energies are look like a half k s squared always, um, at least for simple springs. So we have something like that.
Note that the work done by a spring as it is stretched is always negative. Again, the work done by the spring as it is stretched by something else, the spring does negative work because k is always positive and s squared is always positive. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to let k can't be 0, there's no spring, and s can't be 0, you haven't stretched it. So we're fair to say this is strictly uh, a negative thing. And that should make sense. If the spring is attached to some object and that object is stretching the spring, the spring would be slowing the object down. If we were like to throw something past and it catches the spring and then pulls it after, it will slow down the object. So the kinetic energy will be reduced, which means the negative work. Of course, this means that the object does the opposite work on the spring. The object will do positive work on the spring as I stretch it, uh, or as the object stretches it. This will be important later when we talk about storing energy in the springs. We found the work done by the spring while it's being stretched, but if it's relaxing while doing that work, it would flip the sign. That makes sense, right? If we if we have the string spring already stretched and we let go, it will pull the end in and it will accelerate an object that's that's uh, attached to it, so it will do positive work on that object. So we would just flip the plus the minus, and we'd find that the work done by a spring while the spring is relaxing is one half k s square. And again, that same kind of format, which is going to keep coming back, but now with a positive rather than negative. And we can use these results to solve some problems that would have been very difficult or impossible using our constant acceleration Newtonian, uh, constant force Newtonian stuff, because we couldn't handle the fact that the spring was changing, or at least it would be very awkward because the acceleration would be continually changing, so we couldn't use the constant acceleration equations. We'll do one example just to say what that looks like. For example, Fergus is going to catapult himself forward by stretching a bungee cord by 2.3 meters and then releasing. He happens to know, because he's done the measurements, that the spring constant of the bungee cord is 93 newtons per meter, and his own mass is 55 kilograms. Uh, it's important to understand a bungee cord is maybe not, it's certainly not a coiled piece of metal, and it's not really a perfect spring, but it, and it mostly obeys Hooke's law while being stretched. All right. Um, if Fergus is moving along a frictionless floor, at what speed does he leave the catapult? So he's pulled himself back, and now he's just using it to accelerate him. In this case, the spring is relaxing. He stretched the, the bungee cord by 2.3 meters, and it's going to go back to its original length. So we would use the positive form for the work done. The spring does positive work on him, and it turns it into kinetic energy because the system here is just Fergus. So work is being done on that system, so the work is always delta E, but since he's the only thing in the system, delta E is delta K, and we get a half KS square equals a half MV square which lets us do some simple algebra, cross multiply by the halves, they go away, um, divide by the m's, take the square root, and we get that the velocity here would be square root of ks squared over m. Again, I would strongly recommend against trying to memorize this. This is a very specific uh, situation. Better to go back to always that the work done by the spring will be delta k. We throw in the numbers, and we find that he's launched at roughly 3 meters per second, which is not unreasonable. Uh, a little bit slower probably than he could run, but he you know, didn't have to put any muscle work into it. 